The weakness of language models is the hallucination, the inability to understand fact, um, the lack of, of symbolic logic. If you think about it in a creative setting as a, a tool for expanding creative play, that actually becomes a huge asset. I'm with Hillary Mason, the CEO of Hidden Door. Previously, Hillary was a professor of computer science, the chief scientist of Bitly, and the head of machine learning at Cloudera. At Hidden Door, Hillary is building games that use generative AI. Hillary, welcome. Thank you. It's really delightful to be here this morning. Hillary, I really want to talk about the way you're using generative AI in gaming. Most people are currently thinking about it as part of the production process That's right. to make art and content. Yeah, you're actually using AI in the game itself. So can you elaborate on that and just sort of maybe zoom out the camera lens a little bit? What what did you set out to do with Hidden Door? Absolutely. Um, so at Hidden Door, what we're trying to do is create the ability to take any work of fiction, whether it's a movie, a TV show, a novel that you fall in love with, and to let you play, role play in that world. And so what we're trying to create as a product experience is that ability that you fall in love with something and then we take all of the joys you might find from like a tabletop RPG experience and give you that ability to role play immediately in this sort of intersection of like fanfic and RPG energy um, in that world. And for that, we have an AI narrator who's really uh, in like tabletop parlance, like our dungeon master. Um, and so we're really trying to create an experience that a lot of people are creating for themselves in different ways already. So obviously, like tabletop is amazing. Like I've been playing since I was a kid. Um, it's been really influential for me. Um, there are also lots of communities of folks who write fanfic or who, um, you know, find other ways to, to sort of role play or imagine their own stories in those worlds. Um, and so what we're doing with Hidden Door is using technology to make this experience something that has almost no friction to access. So, you know, if you're, you are a longtime tabletop player, you know, you have to like have your friends, get them all together. Somebody has to do the work to like plan the adventure. Somebody has to learn the rules well enough, if not everybody, um, like there's a lot of work involved in that play. We're trying to remove all that work make a very accessible experience that still brings you a lot of those same collaborative, co-creative joys. Um, and our players don't need to care at all that there's like a, an AI system behind the scenes. It's just the thing that allows our product to exist at all in this moment in time. I really want to drill into the technology a little bit more, but let's spend a little bit more time on, on the games and the game ideas. So you talked about the ability to overcome some of these scheduling kind of problems with getting your, your Dungeons and Dragons group. Mm -hmm. What's the AI going to bring to the experience that is, is unique and new for people to, to now experience a kind of game that they haven't done before? I feel like I need to introduce this by saying we have a, a few principles of how we use AI that I think are important to say out loud. One of them is that I do not believe machine learning systems are themselves creative. So they are really great at understanding sort of the world's knowledge and representing it to us, showing us spectrums of possibility, predicting what is likely to happen. But they are not creative in the way that I might be. And when you think, of, or you, you are, or anyone listening is, right? And like, when you think about what makes the joy of playing a game with your friends, it's not that the story is like the world's greatest novel story, right? Like the story of your game is usually, frankly, something only you and your friends care about. It's that creative improvisational energy that you have together that's funny, where you're also bouncing against the rules and sort of the laws of physics of the world you're playing in. And your GM is, is like a partner in sort of pushing back on what you're doing, setting up the challenges and like, collaborating with you in that story to go forward. And so the role we see here for the technology is sort of um, 
setting out some of those rails and enforcing it and sort of routing stories back around and, and surprising you. It is creating the space in which you play. So creating the world, writing it out. Uh, we generate text and art dynamically together, sort of like a, a graphic novel or like a live web comic as you play, giving you that ability to do anything, have the world push back and respond to you in a way that makes sense, and then progress the story forward in a way that feels fun. And so I'm going to say that, that our principles are such that the system exists as a facilitator and sort of a, a like tool in this process, but really it is the players together sort of bouncing off each other and bouncing off the system that create that, that sort of fun thing and those memories together that you care about or that like yeah I don't I don't know what your play style is but you might see that like like maybe I see that like oh there's some sort of like bad guy here and like you're gonna gear up to attack it and I could either decide like oh I'm gonna help you like or maybe I'm gonna like start like singing love poetry and distract it and so what the system does is sort of take those those actions those those intentions and integrate them into a whole in a way that ends up colliding with that sort of, you know, delightful surprise. What I'm hearing part of the game system is though, is, is there are also constraints. There's, there's sort of rails to keep it fun. Like ga games are essentially systems of constraints, right? Yes. So I, I think a lot of people have probably tried at this point, like go to chat GPT and, and go through role-playing scenarios and, and it kind of reacts to you and will do a lot of interesting things. Yeah. Um, but I wouldn't call it a game. I'd call it like, so how do you bring the, the structure? That sounds hard. <laughs> well, first I have to say, I'm very lucky to work with a very good game director, Chris Foster, who has a lot of experience mm -hmm. and I've learned a ton from him. So I'm going to try and channel him in answering this, which is that, as you say, it is a game. It is not a writing tool. It is not an improv tool. It is not one in which you as the player get to decide like, oh, I didn't like that die roll. I'm going to change what happens. There are a few other tools out there using similar technologies to create those experiences. Tools like PseudoWrite for professional writers. They're great, mm -hmm. but they're not games. We're building a game, which means you can lose. Like you, you have to try things and you have to fail at them. Um, and one of the design challenges we've thought about is really what is that structure? How do we embrace the seemingly contradictory problem of you can do anything with a world that pushes back, but not always. So sometimes you can, can you know, like sort of direct the story and other times you can. And for that, we look to what a really good uh, narrator, a really good GM would do. You know, we all sort of, when we play these games, you know, we have these sort of social storytelling conventions we adhere to that are really helpful for us too. Like you don't split the party. You understand that if you're trying to do something to sort of derail the overall narrative arc your GM is building for you, like the GM's going to like push you right back, right? So like um, we've built similar things into the narrative system to, to sort of build on that kind of expectation of experience of how the story is going to go. Um, even if you decide that like the way you're going to play is to be as uh, provocative and uh you know, all you're going to do is like put the poop emoji in over and over again and like let the system <laughs> deal with that, which is totally fine. Like it, it'll route you right back around with some of those constraints. Don't, um, don't, and don't split the party. And, and, <laughs> and my fa I don't know if you deal with this or not, but like the, the griefing player who's going to be like backstabbing the party. Like there's always <laughs> the player in the, in the experience of tabletop RPGs that does that. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm curious, have you thought about like those social elements as well? We do. At this point in our development, our, uh, we basically assume you're playing with your actual friends and you have a way to yell at them beyond what's in our system. And you can ultimately, of course, kick people out of your game if they are really, really bullying or griefing. Um, but otherwise, yes, the system will do its best to be like, it, we had one, one thing when our team was playing once where, um, you know, there was a dramatic climactic battle and then we had one guy who's just sitting there eating a bowl of spaghetti and so like of course the frame that gets generated is like two characters with their swords out like ready to go and then the one guy over here eating his bowl of spaghetti in the corner because he was trolling <laughs> um and that's fine like that that just becomes funny uh when you bring it all together you know 
Um, so, so there's, I would say this is a design problem. So from design problems to the technology problems, what were the technology problems? I mean, we started this work, um, founded the company three years ago. I've been working with LLMs and tax models for quite a bit longer than that. And so, you know, we started very much with an approach of um, controllability, which is, as you say, if you do go to chat GPT or, or any of these models and um, you sort of try to play along with it and say like, okay, you're the dungeon master and we're playing this game and what happens? Like it kind of works, but it also kind of doesn't and it forgets things and it introduces things and then um, things sort of go on the rail, like on the rails, off the rails. Like they don't really follow the arc of the story in the same way you want the action paced and all that stuff. Um, so we started very much at the beginning thinking a lot about controllability. Um, and if I bring you back to the premise in our case of our business model, which is working with um, authors and IP holders to be able to create games out of their worlds, controllability becomes very important because if you're like an author of a novel and you're going to trust mm -hmm. us to allow people to play their own stories in your world, like there are things you care about, like your characters must behave in the way that you in, you want them to. You want to fix points of what might happen in space and let the system sort of generate into that, but not make up its own like major you know, changes. And so we started from that position of controllability and essentially have built at the technical level something that is a game engine. Like there is an actual database with every character, item, location. It has stats, like it has a character sheet. Um, those stats change over time, depending on the actions, logically. Um, and that is something that uh, even for the things that get generated along the way. So maybe, you know, you say something like, oh, um, you know, I pick somebody's pocket and you succeed at that. And then it's going to generate an item that you would have pulled out of that pocket. That item would have been uh, like it's a row in a database now. It exists. Um, and I will say also that... Uh, Alongside that controllability, we can also think about safety. So we can do things like manage a lot mm -hmm. of the, the biases and other problematic content that can otherwise come out of large language models. Um, not perfectly, of course, but we have layers of approaches to reduce the impact of those risks. Um, we can also, because we uh, don't allow, we allow plain text entry, but it gets interpreted through our system. We can make sure that people are, let's say you put the word Nazi in and it will interpret it as nacho. So like, you know, it will come back with some pretty funny stuff, but it will not allow you to inject that into the game. And that's a decision we've made. Um, and then on the, the last bit, uh, we have this principle we, we call sketching in pencil and then drawing in ink, which is our system will perhaps imply or hint at aspects of the world, but until players interact with them, they can change to propel the story forward. So you might have something like, oh, you know, I pick up a piece of fruit and it'll be like, oh, you pick up an apple. There's an apple in your inventory. And then maybe, and this is a bad example because I am not a good you know, off the top of my head game narrator, maybe, you know, some wizard appears and is like, hey, I need a green thing to let you pass. Well, you have an apple. We don't know what color it is, but we can set that color if you're like, oh, I look for a green thing in my, you know, in my backpack. We'd be like, oh, you have an apple. There's a probability that's green. Like, let's make it green. And now it'll be green forever. We've like set it in ink. You've looked at it. It's set in the database, which is an actual Postgres database. Like there's no NFT bullshit or anything like that. Um, and like now you can play with that. And so that's uh, that's another aspect of our game engine. I think it's really what's cool about it is being able to use these data structures, which are very common and in our case, even very simple, alongside language together as something that we can then operate on. Um, the idea of being able to put this in the hands of IP holders or work with them to create their worlds is, is really interesting to me because I've, I've worked with some pretty big IP myself in the past. So, so I remember pitching George R. R. Martin on the Game of Thrones game we built, uh, and this was at the dawn of social games. And, and I told him, you know, this is actually an anti-social game because everyone kills oh, yeah. each other <laughs> in Game of Thrones. And the, when I first demoed the game to him, he's like, you know, people aren't dying enough. And we had to go and like increase <laughs> increase the death level, and then that was sort of very opposite to like Star Trek uh, when I, when I worked with that, where 
there's violence from time to time in Star Trek, but it's it's actually not what the universe is really about. It's about optimism and exploration and, and a lot of interesting problem solving and engineering. And we really had to to work hard to bring those elements back into the narrative so that it didn't always just devolve into like phaser mm. battle. So it seems like it could be a really challenging thing um, to get the language model to kind of surface the those principal themes of a world well we think like yes absolutely and also those are amazing stories <laughs> and i would love to play in those worlds um but we think that this is uh like part of of bringing a world in is being able to have a way to define sort of the nature of it and we use a bunch of shortcuts and tools for that because the goal is to make this a fairly like short process. But that means that when you you come in and you say like, okay, here's a new world, you set a mixture. Right now we use um, subgenres, which are essentially like clusters of stories we've built models on. But, but you might be like, okay, this world is like 30% comedy, 50% like high fantasy with a little bit of like modern drama or like Regency romance in there. And what that does for us is give us a, a starting place for these laws of physics, like how much murder, <laughs> when there is murder, like seriously, like it, how much, uh, and, and it's not just like, you know, action oriented versus not, but like, what are the narrative arcs that our system will propose? Is it more of a hero's journey sort of thing? Is it more relationship based? And is there like more of a dramatic relationship based narrative that should be the core of the kinds of stories that come out here? When characters die, um, or like, how do we take something like on the database side, like your character has like slapped me and I've lost one energy point, which is the stat we use on the back end. When that gets expressed in language and art, is this a like Regency style, like, you know, so-and-so like takes a deep breath and like slaps him across the face? Or is this like a, you know, you know, so-and-so like takes their like boxer's gloves and like goes, goes out, right? There's a lot that um the same, let's say the same game engine expression can be expressed in language in any like number of different ways. And so for us, then it's setting the the weights on how we're going to, what does this world feel like linguistically and visually? How are we going to express it? Um, and we use, again, this design metaphor of like infinite possibilities narrowed down to like a few game engine changes like to the game state and then expand it out again to infinite expression possibilities sort of create this, illusion of the space and we think a lot about like um like if you're in the star wars broader universe somewhere somebody has to say the force like every scene or two <laughs> and otherwise like the story can actually be kind of anything at this point like any sort of narrative arc any like it could be about a romance it could be a mystery it could be a heist right it could be like a, a sort of straightforward like there's a bad guy let's get him um and so it's it's also distilling out like what is unique to this world that makes it feel like this world um, and how does that work here? And, and there's a whole bunch of stuff around the language that gets expressed, the kinds of actions that even become possible and how they they happen, the kinds of, of people, I was going to say, but like NPCs you're going to meet, they get generated. Um, like, are they human? Are they alien? If, you know, there's a whole language around that. If we're in a sci-fi, like, is there, you know, faster than light travel? Like, which of these tropes do you get for free in this world? And, like, what is unique about this world, too? Like, can we distill that out? What is the vocabulary that's unique about this world, which, um, which you do have to, we can extract from text, but then you have to sort of give it a thumbs up and be like, we want this word used in this context. Um, so, yeah, there, there's actually you're right on it. Like that is, is one of the core challenges, but it's also the opportunity to build this has become possible because of the technical sort of step function forward. Um, because we're not just building one game for one world, but rather a story engine that can accommodate many. And I would say the secret to that is that 
stories themselves build on tropes and universes build on those things. And so we're able to model those tropes and then give you the tools you need to say like, no, but mine is different in this way. And I really care about this. Um, and when someone dies, and this is something an author actually said to me, like in my world, they bleed out their eyes. Like, how are you going to do that? When you mentioned the percentage of comedy, I couldn't stop thinking about the uh, that robot from Interstellar, where they could calculate like what percentage of funny and honesty and things like that it would have. <laughs> yes, <laughs> as it, it's an old trope, right? Like it goes back to Douglas Adams and like Hitchhiker's mm -hmm. Guide and Marvin the Depressed Robot, and like yeah, we have a we have a rich tradition of that trope. So l let's talk about the technology itself a little bit more that enables this. What what has changed over the last few years that has enabled the kind of games you're making at Hidden Door? So I have to give you mm -hmm. a little bit of history, um, as this is going to be sort of a personal personal journey into this. Um, Going way, way back, as I said, like I've been a DM, like I've played tabletop games for a long time, was in English, studied English and CS in undergrad. So like long interest in writing and, and world building and all that stuff. Um, but in 2014, I founded a different company called Fast Forward Labs, and we were an applied machine learning research and prototyping product building company. So we had, it was like a, you know, halfway house for like misfit academics. We did our own research and we also partnered with our clients to help them build stuff. We published a report in 2014 on natural language generation, um, not using deep learning, but um, we were still able at that time, we built a prototype where we, um, we crawled like 60,000 real estate ads in the New York City area, which is where I'm based. And then you were able to set the structured data of an ad, like a 14 bedroom, one bathroom apartment with a uh, like laundry. And it would generate the text for you. So it would do like, oh, this sun-filled, you know, cozy space will be your new home. Um, and so I've had a long interest in this technical capability um, and have worked with it. And indeed, at Fast Forward, we went on to do a lot of research into extractive summarization, abstractive summarization, always with an eye towards how we would build products with it. And we did indeed, over the, the years, build products with it, with partners, so with we did some in banking, um, we did some in telecom uh, applications that range from customer service to helping very proficient traders um, understand emerging news that was relevant to their portfolio so they could more quickly perhaps make a decision about updating their trading strategies. Um, you will see throughout this, this principle that again, like we're not trying to replace people, but rather trying to use this information modeling to help people make better decisions you know, as they're doing it. It's so like, this has been a core, a core approach for me. And in building a lot of that stuff, um, you know, largely in uh, with Fortune 500s and such, I realized that actually the, the weakness of language models is the hallucination and the ability to, the inability to understand fact, um, the lack of, of symbolic logic. And if you think about it in a creative setting as a, a tool for expanding creative play, that actually becomes a huge asset. And so that's one of the technical realizations is that the ability to say like, okay, I'm going to give you like a summary of a plot so far, what might happen next? And to be able to say like, what is the most likely thing, the least likely thing, give me the full range of like encoded possibilities and let me choose or let me, you know, have another algorithm sort of tuning the probability. This is something we think about in our system, by the way, is like how much of what happens should be the obvious thing that should always happen next and how much of what happens needs to be surprising. Because mm -hmm. if we only do the former, the system isn't dumb, but it is very boring. And if we only do the latter, the system is dumb because it's just like doing random stuff. And, and as a person, you're like, oh, this story like makes no sense. I'm not into it. Right. So it's like tuning that alongside people's expectations. Anyway, that was some of the, the core. That was my technical experience building real deployed production systems around this stuff and thinking about, you know, what is this? Like, it's, essentially, I love living in this space where we have one of these technical capabilities and we have really yet to invent the products and the business models around what becomes possible mm -hmm. or economically feasible now because we have it. Um, and that's where we are. And with Hidden Door, this was um, essentially the, 
the technology finally catching up to the kind of gaming experience I want to see exist in the world and that I think is largely like it feels inevitable to me um, that we will have these systems as a way to play. And, you know, we're, we're sort of taking one shot at what that looks like um, from a technical level because we built, I should say, we built a lot of our own LLMs and our own models. Um, this is, also, yeah, this is not GPT. No. Um, though, though I have to say, like, like it is, we benchmark against all that stuff. And I, I am so thrilled, like as someone who founded a company around sort of open new models of machine learning research in 2014, now to see the incredible community of open research that's springing up for um, community created models and, you know, data sets where we actually do have permission to train on the, like, I, I find it incredibly, like, almost heartwarming. It's, it's, and we build on that too. Like, we fine tune GPTJ and like all that stuff. Um, so I have to give credit there. So it, at the intersection of the technology and the economic feasibility that you brought up, there's been this trend, at least at places like OpenAI, towards bigger and bigger models, although we don't actually mm -hmm. know anything about what's going on inside GPT-4. I, I, I have some thoughts that actually a lot of it came from hyperparameter tuning more so than just adding more and more parameters. But anyway, it's, it's a very, very large model is... You know, my, my understanding is with your technology, you're not going in that direction of bigger and bigger and bigger. So can you talk about that? And also what, what's the economic impact of these bigger models and, and the ability for someone like you and your company at Hidden Door to be able to use language models? Yeah. So I'm going to divide that into two questions. So first, you're right. Like um, what we do is take more of an ensemble approach where we will use a model for a specific thing. And that is what it does. And it's something, it's a much smaller model, which is purpose built for that thing. Um, and that thing might be something like, um, you know, what plot point ought to happen next based on we have a, you know, a data set of, of millions of stories, including lots of open books and all this stuff. And, or it might be something like, uh, let's, you know, figure out the NPC that you're going to encounter given this setup. Um, and we make separate calls to all these things. And uh, we also use a, like a systems metaphor that is rather than sort of like unstructured data into a model and unstructured text back out, we do a lot of unstructured text in, we structure it, we sort of have a database again, and then we take that alongside the text and use that as the, the place we're generating from. And I do think that um, like as a, you know, old ML person, one of the capabilities we've lost focus on is that actually these models are fantastic at going from structured data or some information we already understand to transforming it in a meaningful way. So in our case, it's taking basically our, our game state database or like a change, a delta in that database, like I got hurt. And then in the context of the world I'm in, it is going to express that in language and art for us. But we still have that structured data at all points in the story. So we have controllability, we have memory, we have like an actual game engine, we can do physics simulations if we want. Like it's a, it is a, a somewhat different approach. The other consideration that I think is equally important is actually one of UX. And in our case, it's our game designers and in the future, sort of narrative designers and folks' ability to manipulate aspects of the system without needing a machine learning engineer. So how does a game designer say like, oh, this story needs like more content of this sort of trope and less of that one? Like we need to give them a dial they can tune. Um, and that means the system has to be interpretable as much as possible. Like, so what we do instead is this ensemble of methods. And also, like, again, as an old machine learning person, not everything is deep learning. Like, that's super expensive. Like, I don't want to light GPUs on fire. So, like, we do a lot of pre-generation of stuff, um, do CPU style ranking of stuff, um, and then try to, to make it so that at every point in the story, we understand, like, where did this come from? Why did it happen? What in our game data, like our engine data, like what made this happen versus something else? 
um, so that people who are not themselves engineers or machine learning engineers, so like designers can get in there and play with these tools and their role becomes not like, I'm going to write the bits of dialogue that are going to come out, but rather I'm going to like puppet master the ensemble of systems till I get the experience I want. And that's, you know, something we're doing because for us, like our goal is to create an amazing game experience. It is not to create the world's biggest, you know, fictional language model. Um, we might do that at some point in the future, like as a, as a side effect, but that's not the, the primary thing. And I also think that, um, like even in the creation of chat GPT over GPT-3, like GPT-3 had been out for two years. Chat GPT was primarily a UX improvement over the GPT-3 model, but it set off an incredible amount of creativity and people building on it because suddenly you had a UX where you could interact with it. And that's like the teeniest, like we've gone the other way and tried to build more of a like functional UX for building, curating and puppet mastering these stories. Um, so it just leads to, to both very different technical design and, and somewhat different UX design when you think about it in that sense. And also I should say that I, I believe OpenAI has stated in public, like their goal is to create AGI. So like actually intelligent autonomous intelligences our goal at Hidden Door is to make an amazing game. We have zero interest in AGI, <laughs> so that may also lead to some of our, our differing approaches. I'm not sure I know how to define what AGI means. I, there was this paper that came out recently from Microsoft actually saying that they detected sparks of AGI in chat GPT. I, I mean, What's your thoughts on this whole subject? Like, what is intelligence anyway? You mentioned earlier you didn't <laughs> think these, you didn't think these models were quote unquote creative. I, I find that another kind of. Pro I use the word all the time, but I find it also problematic. I think we're like to be philosophical for a moment. I think we're at a moment where we're collectively realizing that we don't know what intelligence really is, and that for the long history of AI, we've had, you know, this, this Turing test that we've held up as like, cool. Like once we do that, like we've solved AI, but it turns out actually we've kind of done that. And actually we've kind of done it before. Um, like even before LLMs, like there was a Turing test competition where somebody like fooled the, the judges by pretending to be frankly an ESL, like English second language speaker and like a kid. Uh, you know, so so this says more to me about what we put on, like, intelligence is a very heavy word that carries a lot and is not very precise. And I, I find one of the opportunities of this moment is that, like, we can rethink a lot of, like, Chomskyan philosophy of language and intelligence and symbolism, given the fact that we have a thing that can do language incredibly fluently. And it is, it is an incredible technical achievement and it is going to be deeply impactful. Like I, I'm a huge optimist for this stuff. I'm also somewhat of a pragmatist and I don't think that the ability to cleverly manipulate language as symbols equates to intelligence. But also I think we have lost any consensus of what intelligence even is. Um, and actually, I was reading, a, I don't know if you know Julian Togelius, he had this wonderful blog post uh, yesterday, sort of poking at this question, saying, like, how come we're not afraid Elden Ring is going to come to life and destroy the world <laughs> as a, a parallel, like setting it up? And, and so I'd encourage folks to go read it because he just said it very boldly and, and beautifully. Um, but it is, uh, it is really interesting to think that, like, Something that I think we all took for granted, which is that we as humans know what intelligence is, has been questioned now. And also this thing we took for granted in our field that the Turing test was meaningful is also now in question. Um, and, and there's a lot of, you know, pretty viable discussion on all sides. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it's a very exciting moment for philosophers, for computer scientists, for ethicists, for, you know, everybody. Um, what I do worry about is that the focus on things like AGI and AGI risk is taking attention away from the focus on ways that these models may be used to harm people or may be inflicting economic harms, social harms. Um, 
which is not, it's also not a new thing, but it is a thing we are potentially going to see at much broader scale as the practical uses and the economic value become irresistible. And so to give to give a more concrete way of thinking about this, um, and also I, I co-authored a book with DJ Patil and Mike Lukides on data and ethics some years ago. Um, and this was really thinking about like, okay, if you're going to, to deploy automated systems, machine learning models, even st- any sort of statistical analysis and use it to make a decision, like these systems have the potential to have bias. And what they do is they scale that bias. So if we think about like humans with bias, like you're still rate limited to like, like if you think about like human DMV employees with bias, like you're fairly rate limited in where that bias is because a person can only have so many interactions in a day. When you scale that in an operationalized and automated system now, though, you have the ability to take that bias and deeply magnify it. And by the way, these models often magnify the bias in the underlying data because of the nature of the mathematics. So I think a lot of the the focus on the AGI risk is taking attention away from a lot of the harms we may see there that are, frankly, like way more real and way more likely. I could rant about this at great length, so I will stop and let you you say a few things. Well, an adjacent area of safety is also how children are going to interact with these systems because they're going to become pervasive in society. So, of course, uh, kids are going to use it just like kids use Google search right now and encounter whatever. Now, your games, as I understand it, you want children to be able to play your games. Is, Is that we have architected it to be safe for kids as young as nine. Um, and that means following the appropriate regulatory frameworks, collecting no PII, making sure that we have control and consent uh, safety levels uh, appropriately. So yes. Back to sort of this continuum of risk and intelligence and consciousness and all of this stuff. At, at the core of that is this idea of emergent behavior, which I think is also something that game developers, game designers are are really familiar with. So for example, you have a lot of games where you build a certain kind of game, but the players discover a kind of gameplay on top of that, which is emergent, especially in very social games, right? So as soon as you have humans interacting with other humans in an environment, you get a whole lot of behaviors that, that were very unpredictable. It seems like there's this parallel thing happening in the language models where they start with kind of simplistic behaviors and the bigger they get, the more emergent behaviors, the more hallucinatory they get, the feature that you found, uh, not a bug Mm -hmm. for your use cases. Um, Can you talk a little bit about like emergence as a property of these games? And also how do you design with that in mind? Because we're adding a whole new level of potential emergent gameplay by injecting quote unquote, obviously quote unquote intelligent systems into them. I, this is a super interesting topic, and it actually makes me think about a lot of the work going on, like putting LLMs aside and language models aside, like a lot of the interesting work in reinforcement learning. Mm. And so reinforcement, like games have been the um, the primary way we've explored reinforcement learning research now going on like, I don't know, decades at this point. Um, but you might remember like DeepMind writing papers on playing Atari games. And that's because reinforcement learning is a set of techniques where like to say it very simplistically, you have at any moment in time, you have a finite range of decisions you can make. And then at some point you get a score. Mm-hmm. So like, you know, if you made good ones or bad ones, and that's the inputs you need to that system. And and I know also there's a, a lot of energy in the, the AI gaming startup community around doing things like using reinforcement learning for uh, like natural NPC behavior, because frankly, like, mm-hmm. If you took something like GPT-3 or GPT-4 off the shelf, like that's a language model mostly trained on modern American internet plus like as much international stuff as we could throw in there plus some books, right? So like, what is that going to do to like being in like, say, a game engine environment? Like, and yes, it's like the symbolic or or the ability it has to sort of like say things that make sense and can be interpreted as like, oh, I go left or I go right or like that actually is tremendously powerful and useful and people are starting to sort of plug it in but it's still not like it's not a model trained of that game environment right and so I do think and yet reinforcement learning as a technique is also one of the things allowing these models to progress um, to the state of capability they're at 
So I know this is off the top of my head and, and very high level, but I think there's something really interesting to play with in thinking about, as you say, the emergent properties of sort of game design as complex systems, which by the way, I think game designers, frankly, have a, a particular expertise that is underappreciated in the broader AI world. And like, somebody mm-hmm. should write that, that paper. It's not me. Maybe it's you. Maybe it's someone listening. <laughs> um, but that said, like, I don't think we can predict it other than to say that like certainly interesting stuff will happen and yeah, like um, maybe it's, it's like, uh, and, and as we think about it, we need to be very mindful of like where these models come from. And so, so I'll give you like a, like one tip cause I do a lot of technical due diligence on AI products of all kinds. Mm-hmm. And one of the things I do, especially if I'm looking at something like, like a NPC chat application, right? Or like, like there, are, there are several companies out there who will like make characters you can talk to in a game, like as an SDK or just as a, an app yourself um, for various purposes. Like I've looked at ones, everything from like mental health care all the way to like, you know, sexy times all the way over to like, you know, filling in traditional like game roles. Um, I will always try to come up with like, okay, what's this something I can ask this that the thing should not know about in the fictional context it exists in. So like ask it, you know, who won the world series in 1988? Should it know about that in its world? And if, if it does, like, it's probably just plugged into GPT three and therefore, you know, it's not, it's only going to provide one particular kind of experience in that context. If that makes sense. I'm not sure if I'm saying this Mm -hmm. clearly. So it's looking at ways, frankly, to poke the model. Or another example, um, I was talking to a friend of mine who is using uh, chat GPT to analyze music. So she's, you know, a brilliant technologist and she's like sort of an amateur musician. And she was like, yeah, it keeps, I keep asking it for facts about a song and it gives me different answers. And I was like, cool, this is our opportunity to like poke the thing. Let's lie to it. Let's say like, give it a, a song with no melody at all and be like, describe the melody and see what comes out. Like, let's try and understand the boundaries of what these models can actually provide as we introduce them into our, our like fairly complex, messy systems where, as you said, like, we already can't predict what humans are going to do. So now we have this additional chaos agent. This might've been a trick question. Do you have an answer? (laughs) (laughs) I I don't think there's an answer yet, but I think (laughs) emergent properties are one of the super interesting aspects of games, like especially yeah. like massively multiplayer online games. If you've looked at things like Eve Online or World of Warcraft and all these things that players end up doing in terms of their social structures and social systems and their own versions of the way they play the game that come out of the underlying system, that stuff's really interesting to look at. As you mentioned this thing about poking systems about stuff it shouldn't know about, I was strangely remem- remembering a recent interview with, with Sam Altman, actually. He was like, well, the way you'd know if a system is conscious is you'd make sure you trained it on a body of knowledge that completely excluded that so it wouldn't know anything about consciousness. And mm-hmm. if it started expressing a subjective experience like consciousness, maybe it is. But uh, yeah. anyway, that's kind of science fiction, but it's, it's cool to think about. And I think there was another point you were making earlier around how people learn to interact with these models frankly like what I'm proposing is to gaslight it and (laughs) see what it does and I would never do that to a human and so I'm thinking myself about like what are my ethical boundaries and like (laughs) (laughs) sounds like the Dan hack that people are doing to GPT to get it to to talk about stuff that it's supposed to be trained out of Um, speaking of reinforcement learning. So reinforcement learning is like, we could have just spoken for probably an hour about reinforcement learning, but really interesting area that is part of what actually improved the user experience. When we think about the user experience of GPT chat or chat GPT, a big part of it was the reinforcement learning they applied against it. And when you talk about games and the Atari research that you're referring to, I'm also thinking about the research around poker and then diplomacy recently. So diplomacy is really interesting because it actually had to use language to negotiate with other players. And, and that seems like a whole fertile area where you want to constrain the kinds of language that it's going to 
that it's going to use to something that's relevant to the game, but it also has to be expansive enough to to also be able to kind of act like a human would in that context. Right. And it's playing, you're kind of playing two games, or at least as a human who has played Diplomacy, you have the game and then you have the social game you are playing on top of the game where the game is a scaffold really for that social game. And so it is really interesting to think about, uh, let's say, automated systems in that context as well and learning to play those, those games at multiple levels at the same time the way a person would. And I also wonder, like, again, having played Diplomacy, like, you either play that with friends that are so good that, like, you'll still be friends after you stabbed each other in the back or with people you don't care about anymore. <laughs> so, like, you know, I wonder uh, where the system will, will fall on that, like, like, are we going to be closer because of this? Diplomacy is one of those games that has the reputation of like a good game to play if you, if you don't want to be friends with someone right. anymore afterwards. Hillary, this this has been an awesome discussion. I hope it really inspires people who are thinking about games to utilize some of the AI technologies out there to build really creative products. But before we end, I've been running an experiment. Okay. So I, I have an envelope here and I asked chat GPT before we got started and knowing that we would be talking about language models and stuff anyway, I said, chat GPT, what would Hillary and John talk about in a conversation <laughs> in like a fireside chat? I just glanced at it to make sure that it gave a response, but I'm going to open up and, and we're going to see how it did. This is just, I, as far as I know, this experiment has never been run. All right. Let's see. This is let's very see. dramatic and exciting. <laughs> let's see what ChatGPT said. Let's see if it, we missed anything that we should have talked about. So it said we should talk about the future of AI and its potential impact on society, the role of data science and machine learning in developing a personalized user experience. I'm not going to list all the things it did because it had too many here, but strategies for building and scaling online communities. Yeah, we didn't quite get to that. That would be, that was sort of touch the emergent stuff. The ethics of data collection and usage and how to balance the benefits with the potential risks and harms. So it, it knew that was a topic that you cared about. Well, thank you, ChatGPT. <laughs> I do. So interesting. So it, it did a decent job of kind of intersecting some of the areas that, that we're interested in and, and coming up with that. I'll, I'll post the actual response it did in case anyone is super curious about this. And, and maybe I'll, I'll run more experiments. This is fun. Yeah. Hillary, thank you so much for being part of this conversation. Thank you. This is great. 